Please remain standing for the Pledge of Allegiance. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, Heavenly Father, I just um, come before you and ask your blessing upon our mayor and the city council and all the decisions they make. Just bless them, strengthen them, be with them. I pray and thank you for our great city and everything that concerns our city, Lord. Tonight we just lay it at your feet. I pray for our police department, our fire department, and ask God your blessing again, once again, upon our city. Amen. Amen. Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. It's on the consent of the judge. 11. 11. Mr. Clerk, please call the roll. Ms. Graves? Here. Ms. Johnson? Here. Ms. McClellan? Here. Mr. Riddick? Here. Mr. Smeagol? Here. Mr. Thomas? Here. Dr. Wibley? Here. Mr. Alexander? Here. The motion is to dispense with the reading of the minutes of our previous meeting. Ms. Graves? Aye. Ms. Johnson? Aye. Ms. McClellan? Aye. Mr. Riddick? Aye. Mr. Smeagol? Aye. Mr. Thomas? Aye. Dr. Wibley? Aye. Mr. Alexander? Aye. Mr. Clerk, please read the resolution certifying the closed meeting. The resolution certifying a closed meeting of the Council of the City of Norfolk held in accordance with the provisions of the Virginia Freedom of Information Act. Adopt the resolution. Ms. Graves? Aye. Ms. Johnson? Aye. Ms. McClellan? Aye. Mr. Riddick? Aye. Mr. Smeagol? Aye. Mr. Thomas? Aye. Dr. Wibley? Aye. Mr. Alexander? Hi. Uh, good evening. For the benefit of those who do not regularly attend our meetings, our procedure tonight is to first take up ceremonial items. Next, we'll take up public hearings, then the consent agenda, which will be voted on in a block. If any member of the council or the public wishes to discuss an item, we will remove that item and consider it separately. Following the consent agenda, we will take up regular agenda items in the order as they appear on the docket. Upon the completion, of the agenda, we will take up any new business to come before the council. To address the council, you should have signed up outside the lobby with the clerk prior to 7 p.m. When your name is called, please come to the podium, state your name, and please limit your comments to three minutes. Mr. Clerk, we don't have any ceremonial items. The motion is to for PH1 to be withdrawn from the docket. Yes, sir. Motion to withdraw, Ms. Graves. Aye. Ms. Johnson? Aye. Ms. McClellan? Aye. Mr. Riddick? Aye. Mr. Smigo? Aye. Mr. Thomas? Aye. Dr. Wibley? Aye. Mr. Alexander? Aye. PH2, the motion is to continue until July 18th. Ms. Graves? Aye. Ms. Johnson? Aye. Ms. McClellan? Aye. Mr. Riddick? Aye. Mr. Smigo? Aye. Mr. Thomas? Aye. Dr. Wibley? Aye. Mr. Alexander? Aye. PH3, uh, this is item is an appeal of a decision of the Architectural Review Board for a certificate of appropriateness. Our procedure for this item will be as follows. The city will present a summary of the application and the procedures before the Architecture Review Board. Next, the person noting the appeal will present his or her case. Several people may participate, but the entire presentation shall last no longer than 15 minutes. Each member of the public who signed up to speak on this item then will be individually called and may, may comment on the question of whether or not the appeal should be approved. Each speaker's comments will be limited to three minutes. Following all comments by the public, the applicant will be given an opportunity to provide additional rebuttal, limited to three minutes. Following the rebuttal and any discussion or questions by the council, a vote will be taken as to whether the appeal should be approved. Mr. Newcomb, welcome. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, members of council. Um, this is a public hearing to review a request to demolish 339 Fairfax Avenue. As you know, that property is located in the Historic and uh, Cultural Conservation District of Ghent. Any uh, require or any request to demolish a building has to receive a certificate of appropriateness. This item was presented on December 5th to the Architectural Review Board uh, by the property owner and, and uh, a uh, consultant from Richmond, Mary Harding Sadler, who is a historical architect. They presented evidence that the building had been uh, greatly 
revised through its lifetime. It was built in the uh, 1900s, and that the building was no longer um, significant and contributing. The uh, historic districts of Freemason and, and Ghent were established in the late 1970s based on studies that were done for the city. Properties were uh, looked at. They were identified as either being significant or contributing. This building was identified at that time as contributing. The alterations to it that had occurred through its years were already done. Uh, it essentially uh, had a turret that was removed at that time. A wraparound porch was removed. Windows had been changed. A rear porch section had been removed. But that was all done before the designation of the district in 1977. The um, process that you go through to do this after a person uh, is uh, presented to the Architectural Review Board, if they are denied, they have a right to appeal to council. That's what we're doing today. The review criteria are four elements that are in your packet, but I'm going to read those quickly. Number one, whether the structure is a building determined to be contributing to the district. That's a question that we have to consider. For purposes, a building is contributing to the district if it has not been so altered by later renovations that the architectural integrity of the original building has been substantially compromised. And it is identified in the National Register nomination. Or if not identified in the register, then a determination is made that the building was constructed during the period of historical significance for the district as identified in the register. Number two, for a building that is determined to not be contributing to the district, whether it is of such old, unusual, uncommon design, texture, and material that it could not be reproduced uh, or, or um, could be re reproduced only with great difficulty. Three, for any building that's determined to be not contributing to the district, whether it is situated in relationship to other buildings such that it has significance beyond any individual merit and the demolition would adversely affect the continuity or character of the area. And four, whether the demolition would be detrimental to the public interest or would be inconsistent with adopted general plans. The Architectural Review Board um, considered the application and they recommended uh, by a vote of four to two with one abstain to deny the demolition request. Essentially, the building is identified as contributing in the documents that established the historic district of Ghent. They were done, as I noted earlier, after most of the renovations to the building. Now, the building um, is in very um, disrepair at the moment. There, in this process, we require that an appraisal be presented. The appraisal was done uh, by the applicant and the uh, structure was uh, appraised at $250,000. We require a structural report. There was a structural report done um, and presented, and the structural report indicates that the building is in very difficult shape. And an estimate from a, a contractor uh, who has experience during historical restoration uh, was presented, and the estimate was approximately $900,000 to restore the building. The um, board's decision uh, indicated that they felt that alternatives to renovation had not been further explored and that it was not, um, that the case had not been made for the demolition of the building. Do you have any case questions? case had not been made that what? I'm sorry. I'm sorry, I couldn't hear you. The case had not been made The case had not been made sufficiently that uh, all opportunities had not been explored to renovate the building. According to the Architectural Review Board, but a four right. Right, so that, they, that the case had not been made that all um, possibilities for renovation had been explored. Is that, that is correct. Right? Okay. But you have a $900,000 estimate to, re to restore a building that's appraised at $250,000? That is correct. And was that 900000 to take the house back to its original 1900 or was it to repair it? it? I think it's probably to basically put it into a usable condition. The building um, was damaged about 2013 uh, with a storm. There's been a hole in the roof in the back of the building. 
the um, owner indicated at the meeting that uh, approximately that time he made a determination that he wanted to replace it and so he stopped did he what that he wanted to replace the structure and that he stopped investing in the building so the building does have um, some serious structural issues any questions all right thank you Could, could I just dr. Wibley tell me about code enforcement in this situation or lack um, thereof code enforcement has been undertaken on this building and the property owner has actually appeared in court um, his answer I believe to the court and, and I was not involved in that process was that his intentions were to remove the building and that he was following the process to do that and the court actions were continued until this has been resolved by you all in a final motion and would that have been as early as then 2013 I think the the um, the the best I can track back, and it's the Department of Neighborhood Preservation who was involved in the code enforcement, but I, the, the most recent comments I have on that go back to last year, to 216. Because you but, told me that there's a hole in the roof in 2013. Wouldn't that correct. be a code violation? Yes, ma'am. And so we have no repair that's been done. That is correct. For three years, four years? Three to four years. And you have water coming down. And the, the hole was in the back of the building, um, not necessarily visible from the street, but there, there were calls from uh, the community to the hotline about the building. The inspector that went out uh, talked to the property owner, and as I originally understood, uh, was going along with the idea that they were gonna demo the building. We contacted property uh, neighborhood preservation and inform them that that was not possible without permission for the COA, the thing we're here today for, and that would they please uh, pursue code enforcement as it should have been. So, you know, I, it may not be, because we can't go back, yeah. no. but help me understand how a city lets this go on for four years um, without, um, I mean, you know, that somebody isn't informed that he needs a COA. It's really very troubling to um, hear something like this happen. <clears throat> we can address that this evening or we can have James Rogers talk to you at a work session, uh, whichever you work prefer. Work session. Work session. Yeah. Any other questions? We get the questions for Mr. Newcomb from the council. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Riddick. Yeah. Then it, the uh, structures to the right of this, are they relatively new? <laughs> yes. I, I don't know. Yes, they're all, they're probably built in the 90s or 2000s. Right. Yeah. In the wind, they're the they're the new town um, yeah. okay. homes yeah. just to the right on Fairfax. Yes, they, they look they look new, and I'm wondering why it would be an objection for the uh, this property to uh, mirror that. I think we're going to hear from the neighbors who really? don't have that objection. Okay, you know the 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 difficulty you face in this is the essence of a historic district is preservation of right. character, and so there's a strong belief that you go as far as you can go to make sure that the properties that are there are maintained and carry their architectural integrity forward. Right. Now the properties that I mentioned that, that asked if they were new, I guess we have no idea what structures were there before these were built because they should have had a little historic character too. The, um, the history of Ghent is interesting. If you look at it, uh, go back in your minds to the 60s and the property was an awful lot of rental in, yeah. in the Ghent neighborhood. The housing authority put together an inspection program. The zoning was changed, and Ghent became quite an uh, affluent and very prosperous neighborhood. Yeah. But from the end of World War II up to probably the 70s and 80s, there was an awful lot of deterioration in Ghent, and a lot of the structures were not well. And some had been removed prior to the historic zoning being established in the late 1970s. Okay. If the Mrs. Graves, if the applicant is allowed to demolish and rebuild, are they building in accordance to the properties that were built in the 90s and 2000s, or are they having to rebuild a structure that is of similar? 
character to the age of external character to the age of the structure that's being taken down. What would happen is plans would be, and, and they have, I believe the applicant has plans, but plans would be presented to ARB and looked at. Ghent is, is not a track community. So there are very few houses that look like each other side by side. And there's a very wide diversity of both building materials and architectural styles in that neighborhood. We have stone, we have wood, we have slate, we have brick. Um, but I guess what I'm asking you, uh, Lenny, is um, when a person buys a property that has a tenant, the lease runs with the property, not with the owner. Does, in this case, the historical interest, the historical value the historical designation does that run with the land so that the rebuilding would have to be of the same the uh, rebuilding would have to receive a certificate of appropriateness right from yes. the architectural review board and they would look at the proposed architecture to see if it was in character with the neighborhood okay Okay, so, that's so, what I'm asking. That, yes. That's the answer to my question. Mr. Okay. Cullen? So if I can, for example, there have been other, this happens to be um, near where I live, so I'm familiar with the, the surroundings, and there have been houses, one across the street from me, um, built within the last four or five years um, that incorporates a lot of elements from, from the neighborhood as well, but it is new. So. Right. You know, you, th there are times you drive through there and you can pick out the newer ones, and there are some that you can't. Right. Okay. It just depends on how well it's pulled off. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Newton. Okay. Mr. Friedel. Mr. Friedel, you have about 15 minutes, you and your party. I have no party, and I shouldn't need 15 minutes. Yes, sir. Thank you. Um, maybe just to jump out of order, I handed out a package of things, and at tab 9 are the elevations of what I've proposed to replace the house with. And if you look also at the wide series of photographs that I also passed out, um, you'll see where I've crudely superimposed this elevation on a picture of the whole block. It looks similar to the house uh, two doors to the left. And I think the architect did a nice job of creating a transition between the more modern houses to the right and the houses uh, on the rest of the block. Uh, my house is next door at 333, so I have a fairly strong interest in having it done nicely. Okay. Um, I want to do this with pictures, and I ask that you first look at tab one in that package. The question before you is, is this structure contributing? And the context to judge that in is at tab number four, which is a compilation of the other frame houses in the immediate neighborhood. And what you can see without an architectural degree and even more clearly, maybe if you have one, is that all of the other houses reflect a lot of ornamentation, architectural elements, gables, bay windows, porches, and um, combinations of those things, turrets. This house has been stripped of all of that. The other uh, context that's beneficial is on the broad uh, photograph sheet, which is the two block area that this house sits in. And so when you look not only at the other frame houses, but uh, even more so the stone and brick houses from the period, all of them have significant architectural elements to it. To give you um, a sense of what's gone there was a postcard at the uh, Slover Library, and a picture of that, which is not very easy to read, is at tab two. But we've done a, um, a sketch 
at tab three that tells you the kind of brutal history of this structure. So it started as a fairly ornate Queen Anne house. A two-story rear porch was removed. The houses on either side were demolished. Asbestos siding was put on it all around, which in addition to changing the appearance dramatically, has contained a lot of moisture, which has caused a lot of deterioration that was not visible. The house had a turret on the front, which was demolished. It had a wraparound porch on the front, which was demolished. It had a bay window beneath the turret, which was demolished. Even the windows, which the architect explained to me were kind of the eyes and soul of the house, were changed to things that had nothing to do with the period of significance when the house was originally built. And shutters were screwed into the walls um, around the windows. So it, it's, it's tempting to stop there because I, I think to the trained or untrained eye, it's hard to make a case that this is contributing to this neighborhood. But as required for the process and, and beneficial uh, to my understanding, Ms. Sadler, who is a historic architect from Richmond, done many, many uh, renovations for the state and uh, around the state. Um, her findings after her extensive analysis are at tab six. And in summary, and you can look at the details where she explains all of the changes, she finds that the building does not contribute to the historic district because its original appearance and configuration have been changed beyond recognition. The building has been irretrievably altered by inappropriate renovations. And then um, she makes a um, comparative point. The building has lost more essential historic exterior features than any other contributing frame building in the historic district, and she drove the entire district. The the folks that did the survey, which were mostly volunteers, that uh, determined what was contributing, uh, pretty much included everything that was existing at the time, and they basically made a mistake here. Um, they didn't have the benefit of the research that we had done to understand what the house originally was. They declared it a colonial vernacular or something like that, and that's kind of like taking Michelangelo's David and taking off all the appendages that are still there and declaring it modern art. It, it just doesn't make any sense to take, say it's something that was Queen Anne and has everything stripped off is some other architectural form. There was no effort to, to make it into anything of architectural note. The same conclusion was reached by the structural engineer, Mr. McPherson, who also has experience in this sort of thing. He noted that the uh, structure was in poor condition. Um, he goes through at tab seven a list of all the things that were beneath the surface that would make a rehabilitation very, very expensive. And he concludes that there's very little of its original historic fabric still in the place, and that is, barely, is badly deteriorated. This building does not contribute to the historic district it falls in. And as Mr. Newcomb referenced, the historic contractor, um, not including soft costs like architectural fees, pegged this one at $900,000, give or take. And again, I've got a picture of the rendering of what I'd like to replace it with and how that would look on the street as uh, tab nine. So let me rewind for a second. And uh, how did I get here? Um, this house. Um, was next door to my house. I, um, it came up for sale. It's a triplex. It had eight people living in there. I didn't want a triplex with eight people living in it next door to me. Um, and I needed a place um, I was projecting out a little bit that I was going to move my father into where I could keep an eye on him. He was living alone in Algonquin Park at the time. So I bought the house and um, 
gradually let the leases roll off, except for my father, obviously. And um, it was kept up as long as he was there. Um, once he stopped living there, I admit that I did not keep it up. There was a lot of cosmetic stuff that I let go, and I also did not pursue this process as diligently as I should have. I don't know how many um, of these have come before you, but it's a kind of a daunting process. And every time I steeled myself to do it, I uh, found an urgent matter at work and other things to give me an excuse to put it off. But the, the expensive stuff is under the skin and was not something I was aware of until Mr. McPherson was, was brought in to do his analysis. So I suggest to you by, that by looking at this in context and or reviewing Ms. Sadler's analysis, you can confidently reach the conclusion that this is not a con contributing structure. And it also makes no economic or aesthetic sense to try to put it back. There's really nothing there to build upon. Um, it can't be used as a triplex anymore. It was built originally as a duplex, so making it in a single family is to make it into something that it never was. The interior stairways and places for them aren't even there. So I would appreciate your permission to replace it with something that's more in keeping with the neighborhood. Thanks. Questions? Mrs. McClellan? Just, just confirming, so when you purchased the house, all of the changes that you referred to that took away and stripped the structure of its historic significance had already been done? That's correct. And I, I assumed I'd get to take it down at some point and put something better there. Thank you. Thank you. There are several people that have signed up to speak. Um, Mr. Connery? Good evening. Uh, my name is Vince Connery. I live at 324 Fairfax, so I'm slightly down the street. I've been a neighbor of this property for 17 years, and I just want to appeal to some common sense, uh, uh, namely that I didn't realize it was $900,000, but the chance that anybody, either Mr. Friedel or some other hypothetical person, is going to you know, come along and pay hundreds of thousands of dollars to renovate a wood frame house in an AE flood zone is, I, I don't think it's slim, I think it's none. So I would just ask that uh, you consider, and one of my neighbors is also presenting a, a petition supported by quite a few of the neighbors, almost all the houses on the block. Um, someone has signed this petition asking that you would allow him to uh, demolish this house and and I realize it's a different process to approve something else but to replace it with something that's probably going to be brick and probably going to be conforming to the character of the neighborhood and in compliance with uh, with the flood zone or the flood plan so thank you Thank you. Uh, Bruce Dolcher. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, ladies and gentlemen of the council. Um, I have the petition that my neighbor was referring to, and I also have a, a letter from my wife and me that I'd like to submit to the clerk. Thank you, sir. My name is Bruce Dalcher. I live at, uh, with my wife at 342 Fairfax Avenue, so we're more or less across the street from the property in question. <coughs> we support Mr. Fidel's proposal. Um, I'm here representing my wife and myself and perhaps some of the other neighbors that asked me to speak this evening. Um, perhaps some of the other neighbors who are here who also support this but are not speaking would care to stand to indicate their support uh, for this measure. Thank you very much. And of course, a number of our neighbors were not free to attend this evening, but their voices are heard on the, on the petition. Uh, right now, I'd just like to make three points. First and most importantly, 
I'd urge you to focus on the matter before you, that is, whether or not the structure can be demolished. That is entirely separate, in my mind and that of our neighbors, from the question of whether the property was adequately maintained over the years. If there's some sort of penalty appropriate for a code violation, by all means, let the appropriate enforcement authorities uh, deal with that. But I don't think um, that's what's before you, and I don't think it is your role. In fact, I think it's a, it might be a, a major distraction to what your role is. Secondly, I'd urge you to take particular note of the views of all of us neighbors on the block, because we're the ones most affected. We're the ones who pass by the site every day, look at it every day, uh, and we have very keen personal awareness of what, if anything, the property contributes. And I can assure you that it contributes absolutely nothing, nor would it even if it were in perfect repair, because what is left of the original structure is simply an anonymous wooden box. Finally, uh, I'd like to say that I have great respect for the role of the ARB in this matter. Uh, our last house we owned before moving here was a 500-year-old house when we lived in the UK, for example. I don't think I've ever lived in a new house in my entire life, but I've renovated seven. My neighbors and I all value old houses, or we wouldn't be living there in Ghent as we do. Um, I just think that oppo those opposing Mr. Fidel's proposal are simply wrong on the issue of the structure's contributing nature or not, and also on the point of its economic feasibility. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Greta Gustafson. Okay. Is there anybody here speaking to not demolish it? Greta. Uh, okay. Mr. Mayor, Council, City Manager, good evening. My name is Greta Gustafson, and I reside at 421 West Butte Street in Norfolk. I've lived in the West Freemason Historic District for 40 years, to say, <laughs> and fall under the same zoning ordinance and design guidelines as the Ghent Historic District. I'm here this evening to state my opposition to approving a certificate of appropriateness to demolish 339 Fairfax Avenue. As chairman of the Architectural Review Board, I conducted the meeting on December 5, 2016, in which Mr. Friedel requested a COA to demolish the building. In his presentation, he admitted neglect of the building over a long period of time and also said that he was prodded by the city inspector in the summer of 2016 into treating this as a real job. I might add that the prodding was in the form of a summons to appear in general district court for failure to comply with multiple violation and inspection notices. I think there were 16 or 17 incidents from the, time, the end of 2015 to the court summons. During ARB's December meeting, I suggested on at least two occasions that Mr. Friedel should request the Virginia Department of Historic Resources to review the contributing status of the building. Had I put that in the form of a question, I might have found out that it had been put before DHR's review team the previous Thursday, that was December 1st, and was found to be correctly classified as a contributing structure in the original Ghent Historic District nomination and remains contributing today. Granting a COA for demolition would be detrimental to the public interest and would be inconsistent with the adopted general plan, which states in part to promote the appropriate maintenance and rehabilitation of existing structures in the Ghent Historic District. I also would like to remind you that in our city ordinance, 9-4.2c of the zoning ordinance states that no portion of the cost associated with preservation that is related to neglect or lack of maintenance of the property by the current owner shall be considered for purposes of determining economic infeasibility. 
So that 900,000 has just been reduced. I respectfully request you deny the COA for demolition of 339 Fairfax Avenue. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Fidel, you have three minutes for rebuttal if you so desire to use your three minutes. No rebuttal, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Questions, comments from the council? Mr. Thomas? Thank you, um, Mayor. I reviewed the packet thoroughly, and um, there are a few things that I found compelling uh, that I'd like to point out. Uh, number one is the uh, report by Mary Sadler. She is a um, very well regarded uh, historical architect in the state of Virginia, and she's pointed out, um, I think, one of the questions that we're supposed to uh, answer as we review this, and that is the economic infeasibility. Um, whether um, uh, code violations have been corrected on time or not, I think uh, there's still quite a bit of economic infeasibility with being able to fix this house to a point where it can be either rented uh, and paid for or sold. And so I find that uh, compelling and something we should take note of. And, and additionally, uh, it was something that um, Lenny pointed out and, and is in the original packet we received uh, and Mr. Fridell, I believe he stated it, but wasn't in his packet, and that is that in 1960, when most of the character of this building was lost from the uh, turret, uh, the front bay windows, et cetera. Um, and I, the, the concern, and I spent many years on the Architectural Review Board, and I share Greta's concern, the concern is that this sets a bad precedent. Uh, the concern is that uh, neglect now becomes your pathway to a demolition certificate. Uh, and so I think that th the message I'd like to send to both Greta and the historical district is neglect cannot be <coughs> the path to demolition. I think there are other determinations that can be made with this particular piece of property that occurred well before Mr. Friedel purchased it that set it uh, apart from uh, a simply a neglect case. Uh, I, I do think that the city and city staff should have prosecuted a little stronger or harder, and we'll talk about that at a different session. Uh, but, but at this point, I think I'm in favor of demolition. I, 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 wait, 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 time. Mr. Smith, the, the vote for this, when we vote on it, if we want it torn down, you're voting? Yes. Yes. Okay, just want to make sure. All right, Ms. Graves and Ms. McClellan. Oh, I'll defer to Ms. McClellan. So I moved into the neighborhood in 2005. And um, at that time, this, this house has always looked like this. It's, it's never, it's, it's been um, sort of the ugly duckling of the neighborhood. It's never looked any different. Um, I, don't, I didn't know that there was damage happening other than I did notice maybe a tar blue tarp happening in the last six months. But I don't see that, um, as Mr. Thomas stated, I, I, I think this decision is not based on an issue of code enforcement or lack thereof, but an issue of, um, its appropriateness, or rather, its contributing character, and I just don't see it having that. All right, Ms. Graves. Um, I just don't see a future for this house. It, it, it is, I agree with Andrea, um, an ugly duckling, and I really don't see a future for this home. I just took a look at the city assessment for um, three twelve Fairfax Avenue, which I think is one of the reference properties um, in this packet, and the city assessment, the current assessment, is three hundred forty-six thousand dollars. Even if that's a paper value and somebody were willing to pay a half a million dollars for it, we've got a property that an assessor says is worth 250 at its current state, which I don't really believe. But then there's $900,000 to fix it. So even if you take that back and you get bootleg contractors to like $600,000, you're still in, I mean, really, you're still in at $800,000 for a house, maybe at best, that might. Um, value three fifty to five hundred thousand dollars, depending on what somebody would be willing to pay for it, and um, I th that just doesn't make sense to me. And from a real estate perspective, I don't know of any investor or builder that would spend that kind of money on a piece of property 
and not be able to get their money from it. Um, and it would take them a gazillion years to rent it out and get their money from it. So it just doesn't make practical sense to me. So to me, the $900,000 value as a repair value does um, factor in because it's not like we can just pull the money out of the sky or that the owner can pull the money out of the sky um, and ever recoup um, his cost. So I, to I favor demolishing it. Mr. Riddick? Well. Yeah. Uh, I wonder will this house should we allow him to demolish it, will we hold him to a higher standard? I'm looking at the houses that are next to it. I'm looking at the rendering of what he proposes. Now, will he have to go back to the ARB, Lenny? Will he have to go back to the ARB? Yes. yes Lenny will. said yes. Okay. Right. Okay, so I wonder. Mrs. Johnson. Um, although we can't go back to the past, um, I think all parties involved, we have to be very considerate um, and mindful of the decisions that we make. Um, although the house may not have been in the we, we couldn't see all of the damage, whether it was from the back or from the side. Um, from my perspective, looking at it, you would have had some question about what is going on um, in this with this house to uh, the point that some flags should have been raised. Um, my great concern that this is happening in many communities. Mm -hmm where that there are structures uh, sitting um, that should be reported um, from the perspective of the citizens um, getting the information to the, the city so that um, we can do our job, but most importantly, that we be aggressive. Um, yes, um, our citizens do have rights, but this house has been sitting up for an extended period of time um, the money that is going to be involved to even consider it um, concerns me, but most importantly, why? Why have we gotten to this point? And that is the question that we must ask ourselves at any given time. How do we get to this point? What could we have done to prevent us getting to um, the decision that we have to take in consideration tonight? Uh, Mr. Clerk, uh, PH3, uh, the vote will be taken as to whether or not the appeal should be approved. Mr. Clerk. We have an ordinance to grant a certificate of appropriateness authorize the demolition of a multifamily building at 339 Fairfax Avenue and located in a historic district. Dispense with the charter requirement for reading the ordinance and adopt Ms. Graves. And I means yes to demolish it, correct? Correct. Okay, aye. Ms. Johnson? Aye. Ms. McClellan? Aye. Mr. Riddick? Aye. Mr. Smigel? Aye. Mr. Thomas? Aye. Dr. Wibley? Well, of course, I will be the dissenting vote here. Uh, we set up this IARB as a council because they're the experts, and we frankly are not. Uh, we heard from Ms. Gustafson that as recently as, very recently, by the state board that are the experts in historic um, houses, that this was, in fact, a contributing structure. We also heard, and I would urge all of you, because I get it, I get the money, but this isn't about money. This is not how we make decisions in historic houses, their preservation. It's not about how much it's going to cost. This is about going by the rules that we established, and this is a very slippery slope. I totally appreciate the neighbors. If I lived next to this house, I'd want it gone too because it is horrible, and it's deplorable that anybody could use the excuse that they're busy with their job, and they let this go, because every one of us here is busy with our jobs, and we don't get that latitude. Um, I'm very disappointed that I think the city is culpable in this. This should never have gotten to this point, and this is why I'm, I'm pleased that we're going to look at this again. Um, you know, it's a, it's a very sad situation that we've ended up in. Mamie's exactly right. We should never be here doing this. I'll be, just because I feel very strongly about the ARB 
and the fact that we gave them the responsibility and we should back them up. I'm going to vote no. Mr. Alexander. Aye. Mr. Clerk, uh, the consent agenda, we will vote on the consent agenda in a block except for C3, C10, and C11. We'll be voting on C1, 2, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 12, 13, 14, and 15 in the block. Mr. Mayor, I'd ask to be removed C4. C4? We're pulling out C3, uh -huh. 4, okay. 10, and 11. Okay, approve the consent agenda accepting C3, 4, 10, and 11. Ms. Graves? Aye. Ms. Johnson? Aye. Ms. McClellan? Aye. Mr. Riddick? Aye. Mr. Smeagle? I don't know if the um, Gilberts are here, but I did want to just say thank you for investing in. Uh, on East Little Creek Road with the Dirty Buffalo coming in. We appreciate your um, business, and everybody's very excited about that. So I. As they should be. Yes. Can we get Dirty Buffalo for dinner for council? Yes. <laughs> Mr. Right. Thomas? Aye. Dr. Wibley? Aye. Mr. Alexander? Aye. Okay, C4, C3, C3. is uh, an ordinance granting a special exception to permit the construction of a commercial communication tower on property located at 7511 Avenue J. And Mr. Clerk, you have. Uh, Couple of speakers, uh, Dono Lehe uh, is not here, but he notes his opposition. Uh, we have uh, CE Forehand, who is an applicant, who's here, and uh, C4. Uh, we have Katie Schumel, who is here as well. Mr. Clerk, call the roll. Dispense with the charter requirement for reading the ordinance and adopt. Ms. Graves. Is there some issue that these individuals have with this, with, uh, with CP? Yes, yeah, CE C Forehand is the applicant. Okay. And Mr. But uh, we pulled it out for a reason. Why did we? Mr. Uh, Thomas what? wants to abstain. For C4. Oh. C4. No, no, I'm abstaining on C um, 10. Okay. C10. So what is C3? And I wanted to discuss C4. I didn't have okay. an issue with three, I don't believe. Okay. okay so why did we pull C3? Uh, C <laughs> what was yeah. the issue? Was well, there, there's a. Anytime there's an opposition, okay, we will uh, pull it to be voted on separately because okay. there was an opposition. Did he state what his opposition? His was? opposition was concerned with cell tower being too close to his business. Okay. Right. I vote aye. Thank you. You're welcome. Ms. Johnson. Aye. Mr. McClellan? Aye. Mr. Riddick? No. Mr. Smeagle? Aye. Mr. Thomas? Aye. Dr. Wibley? Aye. Mr. Alexander? Aye. And C4 is an ordinance granting a special exception to permit the operation of a tattoo parlor named Artisan Body Piercing and Tattoo on property located at 7734 Hampton Boulevard, Suite 3. Mr. Clerk? I'd like to discuss this one briefly, Mr. Mayor. Yes. Um, we've received some letters in opposition uh, and a number of emails in opposition of this application. And so I've done some investigation. It really reminds me of uh, some of my civic engagement in the early years at Ward's Corner uh, when, uh, the, uh, when four kids wanted to put Good Mojo, their thrift store, at Ward's Corner. Um, good, four kids, great, great organization, uh, Good Mojo as well. Uh, but at the time, we were advocate, advocating for a new day at Ward's Corner, and we did not see uh, a thrift store as the direction we really wanted to go in. Um, and as we all know, uh, over time, uh, thankfully, uh, the Perry's redeveloped, and now we have the K&K &K Shopping Center. W what I'm hearing a, a lot, or very similarly, from the neighbors in that area is this is not exactly the direction that they want that shopping center to go in. And, and so I, I stopped by there this morning uh, to, to survey the shopping center myself. And I'll, I'll be honest, it's in pretty poor shape. It's not very impressive. Uh, it's not well kept up. Um, and so I'm having a hard time understanding why we should allow this Maryland-based absentee landlord um, have any extra uses there if they're not currently taking care of their property. Um, with regard to the one of the businesses, with one of the locations there, the Dockside Bar and Grill, they have a sign posted on their door in big red letters that says, yes, we're open. Why is that? Well, it's because the windows are boarded up with plywood. And the places look so bad, it, you would drive by and think it's closed. There are shingles missing. Uh, the wood siding is rotten. It needs paint. It, it's just, if there's peeling paint, um, it's just in a bad, poor condition overall. 
the condition of the rest of the shopping center, which is made up of mostly um, cinder block and paint. Uh, there's a total lack of landscaping. There is an illegal rusted out shipping container that's not supposed to be there. It's parked on the property. Uh, there's a dumpster enclosure that was left wide open this morning when I drove up and took pictures. Uh, there's on the cinder block, there's chip paint, there's rust stains, there's an unsightly billboard. There are HVAC units standing taller than the non-existent parapet on top of the um, uh, shopping center. Uh, again, in, in the main port, there's a total lack of landscaping. And you only have to look across the street at the, the shopping center that replaced the old BP station where there's now a, a Verizon and a new pizza joint. And you'll see what nice landscaping and a nice siding uh, will do for a shopping center. It's some place that uh, you know, citizens would want to go, citizens would want to congregate. You look at this place and it's just not kept up in any way. Honestly, it's, it's my opinion that the owners of this property are being bad neighbors uh, to the citizens in Norfolk, and I don't think we should reward them with any additional uses on that property. And so I'm going to be voting against it. Uh, and, and lastly, I'm sorry, uh, the conditions that the owner has agreed to are conditions that a landowner should be doing whether they are getting a special exception or not. They are agreeing to uh, paint and pressure wash the exterior of the building. They're agreeing to pressure wash the sidewalks. They're agreeing to, agreeing to scrape the loose paint off the exterior of the building, paint the columns, uh, paint the doors and block walls, um, and fix any leaks that may be in the roof. They're not agreeing to do anything that they shouldn't already be doing. So I, I, I thank you for your time, Mr. Mayor, and I'll be voting against this. Thank you, Mr. Thomas. Ms. McClellan. I would, uh, just to echo uh, Mr. Thomas's remarks, um, I similarly received 10, 12, 15 emails um, in opposition to this from uh, the neighbors in the Lock Haven and Meadowbrook area. Um, it, people are concerned with the use. Um, it, I, I, there doesn't seem to be any support in the neighborhoods. All right, Mr. Clerk. Dispense with the charter requirement for reading the ordinance and adopt. Ms. Graves? No. Ms. Johnson? No. Ms. McClellan? No. Mr. Riddick? No. Mr. Smigel? Just say that I, I don't think anybody else on council, I didn't get any emails in opposition to it, but only because Martin talked to me about it. I think just in advance notice, when we have issues like this that are coming up, let us know well in advance so that a presentation, or let Doug know so that a presentation can be done in informal for us to discuss it that way um, during this time we're not because I, I you made a lot of valid points but we could have we have further discussion uh, about this um, particularly with tattoo parlors because we have um, opened that up to more places in the city and this is a good opportunity to use that to help um, fix some of that it's amazing that Lock Haven is right across the street from the shopping center and it's looked like this for such a long time and that it has some of the tenants in it that it does. So it's always surprising to me, but I vote no. Mr. Thomas? No. Dr. Wibley? I, you know, I would agree with Tommy. I, I'm not voting no because it's a tattoo parlor. No. And I think no. that there's um, a misper uh, misperception about uh, that and that we need to change as a council. So I, I want to make it clear that my, my uh, concern about this is only that uh, the owner of the um, shopping center repair this, but if he in fact were to he or she were to get this upgraded and a uh, reputable tattoo parlor came in, I would not be in opposition. No. Mr. Alexander. No. Uh, uh, Mr. Mayor, um, Councilwoman Johnson uh, has asked if you would consider um, a, a motion to allow her to reconsider her vote on the previous previous item on the communication. Right. That'd be a vote. Us, um, yes. Uh, Mr. Clerk, uh, motion is to reconsider a uh, vote by which we previously uh, voted on an item. Is this about the demolition? Uh, no, this is the uh, C3. <laughs> the I just thought maybe I'd have yeah, a, okay. a friend. <laughs> you do have friends, Terry. You do have we friends. still like you. You do. Yeah. Yeah, this is well, we'll this the vote on the reconsideration of this graves. What am I voting on? Voting on the reconsideration. Oh, I. Ms. No. Johnson? No. Ms. McClellan? Wait, 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 w
Mr. Alexander. Aye. And this is the revote on uh, item C3. C3 is before us. Dispense with the charter requirement for reading the ordinance and adopt Ms. Graves. I learned something new tonight. I didn't know we could do that. I still vote aye. <laughs> Ms. Johnson. Um, Mr. Mayor, if you would yes, permit please. me. Um, I did not hear from my residents um, concerning uh, this issue, but they voted for me and I have to make the best decision for them. Um, and so with that thought in mind, um, knowing the community and Avenue J, I wouldn't want a wireless um, tower in my community and I am not going to vote that they get a wireless tower in their community. So I requested a reconsideration of my vote and the answer is no. Ms. McClellan? Yes, hi. Mr. Riddick? I think I already voted no. Yes, sir. <laughs> Mr. Smeagol? I think I have four votes in the last seven years I want to go back on and change. Can I do that? I can think of a couple, too. <laughs> so I started some I didn't know that you could do that. If you, you could, yeah, if you could vote, vote. Oh. Yeah. 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 Aye. Aye. Mr. Thomas? Aye. Dr. Wibley? Aye. Mr. Alexander? Aye. Okay, C-10 is an ordinance granting a special exception authorizing the operation of an entertainment establishment with alcoholic beverages known as Arigame Asian Bistro on property located at 5957 East Virginia Beach Boulevard, Suite 18. C-10. Ms. Clark? Dispense with the charter requirement for reading the ordinance and adopt. Ms. Graves? Aye. Ms. Johnson? Aye. Ms. McClellan? Aye. Mr. Riddick? Aye. Mr. Smeagol? Aye. Mr. Thomas? Abstain. Oh. Doc Dr. Wibley? Aye. Mr. Alexander? Aye. C-11 is an ordinance granting a special exception authorizing the operation of an entertainment establishment with alcoholic beverages known as American Legion on property located at 923 Glen Rock Road. Okay. I have been uh, trying to get uh, some understanding whether this uh, facility would be selling alcohol by the drink or whether they will have a banquet license so that everybody who comes in uh, they would have to go to the ABC board, apply for a banquet license, and have whatever type of operation you want to have there. And uh, it, it would be the first uh -huh. that they would be selling alcohol by the drink. And they currently have a special exception to do that. Mm -hmm. And so, what is before you tonight is to amend that, to expand the uh, hours, and um, change the capacity and entertainment. Okay. So that um, if this ordinance did not pass, Alcohol by the drink would still be permitted there. Okay. Um, but that, that that this reconstituted allows that to continue with more chairs and more entertainment. Okay. And, and Bernard, are the proposed in the change of time, uh, Mr. Reddick, is 8 a.m. until 2 a.m., seven days a week? Yes. Uh, may, on sat what about on, on Sunday? If I may interrupt mm -hmm. for a second. Okay. The American Legion is moving into this location. This location previously was a moose lodge, and it's been another um, men and women of vision. It is the old Flipper McCoy's building, and the American Legion, who are currently leasing from us on a temporary basis off of Wilson Road, Mr. Riddick, are seeking to go here in order to raise money to build their own facility. Mm -hmm. But this is a new operation for them at this location. But Did alcohol they, be 8 a.m. on Sunday? Um, their requested day? hours are 8 a.m. till 2, yes. 8 a.m. to 2 a.m.? Yes, sir. Seven days a week. That would be no different than a nightclub? Is that correct? Uh, uh, it, is a, it is an entertainment establishment, which means that they can have entertainment. It can operate um, in, in somewhat in keeping with what they do on Wilson mm -hmm. Road. So is it is this a mirror of what they already have with the exception of the hours? Is, is this mirroring what they had on Wilson Road? On Wilson Road, they were essentially a grandfathered location. Okay. They but had what been did... there before our operation, but it's my understanding that that's similar to what they have there now, yes. That was part of the grandfathering on Wilson Road, though. Is that, that's my question. Yes, that is part. That was part of the grandfathering on Wilson Road. So all we're amending are the hours. 
And the location. And the location. This is, okay. the, but you know, this is well, over the, by military circle. Yeah, I know. It's Flipper McCoy's. I've been right, there. Right, right. As a child, too. <laughs> yeah. But, so, Lenny, is there any way, because some of this has been coming up at some of these um, private organizations that rent out their facilities and they don't monitor the uh, activities that happen there, um, that, whether it's a teen dance or a, a, you know, a birthday party that gets out of control. Yeah. How, how yeah. much control are, do we have over this? It, it is a special exception. The conditions are very carefully drafted so that they have to maintain their people in that building. They can't rent it out and walk away. They have to manage the building. And the as you all have seen us do, but not frequently, it is a revocable permission. Um, but if you look at the conditions, they go on for about four or five pages in the ordinance. It's one of the more elaborate ordinances mm -hmm. that we've ever Sorry. granted. My, my concern if they would consider doing alcohol on Sunday beginning at 12 noon. Mm -hmm. Other than that, I'm not going to vote for it. Mm -hmm. But we have other establishments that do, but we, I know, but we have other establishments that sell alcohol on Sundays yeah, before I'm still, noon. I'm still, this particular one, yeah. I'm not going to vote for if they don't cut it back to noon. I know we have others that I've been opposed to as well. You have. Um, you know, and it's not, it's just to me, this organization is a very re reputable organization. It seems to me that they would change their, their ABC life. So people not even out of church at 8 o'clock in the morning. Okay. You know? So but I'd like to ask them when they change it to noon on Sundays. So I vote by letter that I'm Robert Drummond. If there's any questions, I'll come up and ask. Them. Yes, please come up. There. Mr. Reddick has a question. But, you have but Mr. Newcomb, so uh, the decision is, um, one, the place for us to approve them moving into the building, and two, the, the alcohol. We don't need to approve them. They're already in the building. building. Yeah, the, the, the time, this time is, being served. Special. This is a permission to have an entertainment establishment. Okay. There have been prior ones there, and the hours... <laughs> As noted on the uh, application, right, I understand, are similar to what the hours were of the last operation there. Okay. What did the last one have? Last one was eight till twelve Monday, Thursday, eight till two Friday, Saturday, eight till twelve on Sunday. Okay. Um, so it's consistent basically with what has already been there, with the exception of two hours in the morning at two o'clock in the morning, if yeah, they want to have alcohol sales were four. So 12, 4 to 1.30 on Friday, 11 to 1.30. So Mr. Riddick's point of starting later than uh, So alcohol was 11? Uh, alcohol was 4. No, on Sunday. Alcohol was 11 on Sunday. <clears throat> on Sunday, it's, a, um, on four Sunday to it's 4 to 12. It was 4 to 12. Okay. Do oh, you understand the request? Yes, sir. Okay. Rodney Drummond. Commander Post 5, Norfolk, Virginia. Address is 976 Baker Road, Virginia Beach, Virginia. I think what we're getting mixed up is the hours of 8 to 8 is my member's room. It's not the room that we're going to be what required, whatever be required to get banquet license and things. It's just my member's room. And we have a church that meet in there now, so I don't think we're going to be drinking 8 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> But that was the, yeah, I believe concern? her name was Susan. Yeah, do you have a she told us to change the hours to cover the member side. That's what we were concerned about, the member side. Right. She's shaking problem? her head and saying no. So. That was, that's, that's, not what, well, that's what I understood. But anyway, um, whatever time you need us to change it to, we're willing to do it. So they, the I think as a, as a private organization, you can have alcohol in your building whenever you want to. It's the sale of it that is no, the... No, we're, we're not going to be... No, I'm just saying. So, but that's, I think that's the concern for Mr. Riddick. But also, I don't know, this isn't a restaurant that's trying to sell mimosas and Bloody Marys mm -hmm. in the morning. So I don't know why we would allow alcohol sales. That, that's the, why I've always supported them, or restaurants mm -hmm. that want mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. have that at breakfast. Mm -hmm. This is You guys are not selling alcohol in the morning at all for any reason. Yeah. So the hours should be... Very if similar we did at that time of morning, sir, we usually having a prayer breakfast. And Budweiser's never on the menu, so. 
<laughs> well, I, I, would just, I would just like for it to, you know, be in the uh, that's acceptance. Mr. Ritter, whatever you need, sir, we're here to do it. We're just ready to move forward. So, can you memorialize, can you restate the change? And Mr. Riddick, we're talking 12? 12 now. Would, mm -hmm. uh, what he's asking is that the starting hours for alcohol sales on, on Sunday. 12 on Sunday, noon. 12 noon. Right. Well, I, I would like the alcohol sales to not be at 8 if it's not a restaurant selling mimosas. I don't understand why we would have alcohol at 8 o'clock in the morning if it's not a restaurant. Okay. A private club could be having mimosas. They can, they can yes. have their own but, alcohol if they want to, but for general, public. for general public and selling, there's no reason for this organization to be able to sell alcohol, eat, they're not a restaurant. Yeah. yeah. And okay, we're so, gonna have a kitchen, sir, and we may it's a kitchen in there, and we may be doing breakfast, but most of us we don't drink first thing in the morning. Right. So what what, what are you asking that the hours of starting right. time? Be I don't ready? think the intent of us loosening the ABC rules in Norfolk were to allow private clubs to be able to sell alcohol that early in the morning. I think it was to allow restaurants. Yeah. to sell mimosas yeah. and Bloody Marys in the morning. So I agree. I, my recommendation would be to go back to the old hours that we used to have on these establishments that have no purpose of selling alcohol in the morning. And I think it was 11 a.m. It was 11. Right. I think Sunday. it was 11 a.m. to whatever, okay. five, the, mm -hmm. during the weekdays and the weekends. So That would be essentially Monday through Saturday. Right. And it doesn't Sunday impact your ability to be able to do any other alcohol in a private on my member your, side. On your right. member side. Okay. Yeah, am I correct in that? that that's correct. It, it, the only thing I am saying on this, let's just make it easy for planning. Let's stop trying to pick and choose on this stuff. This is what we started with, with this special exception when we were trying to simplify this. Don't delineate between this and this. The big deal is that everybody is doing what they are supposed to do. And if you're not, then you're going to be cited. We believe you're going to do what you're going to do, but don't make it so complicated that planning's got to figure out when they're going to sell. They may want to have a function, or certainly some private clubs want to have a function once a year that's a money maker. They're going to sell mimosas. Well, well, Terry, then, I have I, to get a, then I have to get a banquet license. Terry, I was no. never under the impression open, that us loosening, loosening this rule had anything to do with private clubs. Loosening the rule had well, everything to do with restaurants. It I, that, you this know, is a private club. It's not okay. a restaurant. Why Does anybody is anybody bothered by the fact that not everybody goes to church on Sunday? Yeah, right. No, I'm not. Um, I and you know, I'm, I'm really troubled by us delineating by I, you know I'm sympathetic to people's wishes on Sundays, but not everybody that has that restriction in their religion. And for us to start getting into that, maybe I'm opening up a can of worms you, worms you guys don't want to go to. All right, so, Mr. Duncan, what is the... Sir, Mr. Drummond, what are you, what are you agreeing to? Whatever y'all want me to do, sir, I'm going to do uh, it. Uh, what, what, he, <laughs> <laughs> what he is agreeing to right, is the opening hour of 11, yeah. Monday through Saturday, and opening hour of 12 on Sunday. Okay. All right. Okay. All right, All right. Mr. Clerk, we Good. have a Thank you, we have an ordinance before us. <laughs> Dispense with the charter requirement for reading the ordinance and adopt Ms. Graves. I, you know, I, I don't want to prevent them from doing what they've already done. I agree with Terry, and and I go to church on Sunday, and but I, I'm not so narrow-minded that I think everybody does, and that I think that I should impose what I think on everybody else. Um, but I don't want to see them not be able to move forward um, as a as a good um, good citizens in the city of Norfolk working trying to they're displaced from Wilson Road and then working um, to get into a new place and then um, trying to build a, a spot to have a, a home of their own. So um, I vote I, but I, I agree. I think that we make it very difficult for inspectors and planning and all of that when we have this set of hours for these people and that set of hours for other people and it just creates a hodgepodge and there's absolutely no consistency with any of it so yeah i vote i but i think it's unnecessary miss johnson um what was the gentleman's name mr drummond Mr. Drummond, good luck. Where are you? <laughs> good luck in whatever you're trying to, to do with your business. Um, and I'm voting aye. Thank you for coming down.
Ms. McClellan. <clears throat> Will there be pinball machines? Oh, All the pinball machines. Slipping my poise. It's gone. Yeah, so. it's <laughs> Thank you for your patience and willingness to compromise. Aye. Mr. Riddick? Aye. Mr. Smigel? I just want to say, I, I think um, some you're making a mountain out of a molehill on this when you're talking, when you're suggesting that we want planning to do this, we want planning to do this. The, I've been probably the biggest advocate for changing these hours, along with you, Terry, when it comes to restaurants and other things to make it easier on planning. This is not a restaurant, though. It is a banquet hall that has no purpose of selling alcohol that early in the morning. We loosen those rules. So to me, and this is the first time I think this has happened since we've we've changed these, we've been more flexible with this. So, I mean, it, we, we I, I never knew that was an intention of this. I'm not doing it for the same reasons, Mr. Riddick, we've disagreed on that yeah. since, for a long time. It's just that the purpose of this building is not to serve alcohol that early in the morning. And so we do need to make sure that when these come forward, whether it's Knights of Columbus or any other organization that has private building, if that is not their function or purpose, then we shouldn't be automatically just allowing them to have these ABC rules um, to help protect um, possibilities of people violating that or doing things they're not supposed to do. Um, a restaurant's a different beast. Um, and so um, I, I'm supporting you guys because I want you to have it. I just I think we just need to have a different conversation as a council then on um, some of the unattended consequences that come with, um, if we were gonna be that flexible in having these open hours, aye. Mr. Thomas? Aye. Dr. Wibley? Aye. Mr. Alexander? Aye. R1? R1 is an ordinance to amend and reordain Article 13 of Chapter 2 of the Norfolk City yeah. Code 1979 so as to change the name of the Norfolk Interagency Consortium to Community Policy and Management Team, reconstitute its membership, and update Sections 2-530 to 2-537 so as to mirror the Code of Virginia 1950 as amended and move Sections 2-530 to 2-537 from Article 13.5 to Article 13, which will be titled Community Policy Management Team. Dispense with the charter requirement for reading the uh, ordinance and adopt. Ms. Uh, Graves. Mr. Uh, Clerk, Ms. McClellan. Um, I appreciate the fact that we're looking at renaming uh, this organization. This is this is what we've been talking about, Mr. Pishko. Is that correct? Y yes. Okay. Um, and and I, I absolutely support it to conform with um, agencies around the state. Um, my concern is. Uh, there is a change in the makeup of the board as part of this, um, and that makeup change uh, decreases the number of family members or private citizens on the board from, I believe, five to one. Um, and I think that's a significant change, and I'd recommend that change be to two uh, residents um, or family members instead of one. Is that possible to make that change? Uh, y yes, it's um, at the uh, will of the council that um, if this council wants the ordinance to provide for two, um, it can be changed. Mr. Hawks, welcome. Thank you. Actually, there are three um, parent representatives, uh, which is the category of citizen, and then there is also a private provider representative. So there are uh, it, it's not five that would be eliminated from that. There, there are three currently? There are three currently, yes. And so we'd be moving from three to one. Right, which is consistent with the state code. But localities are allowed to have more. So that is within the subject of Mr. Pishko's agreement. That is within the uh, control of city council how many parent representatives there will be. Do we happen to know what our uh, neighboring localities, what the general makeup is of those boards? I, I've worked in two others, and it was one in what each is of your those. Recommendation? What is your recommendation? My recommendation would be one, to have it consistent, to keep us out of problems with quorum, and also okay. remember that uh, Mr. Pishko pointed this out to me when I first started in Norfolk, there are several uh, mandatory groups under the Children's Services Act, such as school representative, uh, court services unit, um, and uh, community services board is now a part of the city. 
but the health department, which is a state organization, they are mandated parties. So basically, the only uh, bodies, the only representatives that are under the direct control of the city manager would be Community Services Board and Human Services, and the only other one that's under the direct control of city council would be the elected or appointed official. At the moment, that's been Mr. Daughtry. Well, I, I appreciate um, all the service that you've had in the city and elsewhere, and I would be happy to defer to your opinion. So with that said, I'd, I'd be happy to keep it as is. Thank right. you. Thank you. Ms. Clark? Ms. Graves? Aye. Ms. Johnson? Aye. Ms. McClellan? Aye. Mr. Riddick? Aye. Mr. Smeagle? Aye. Mr. Thomas? Aye. Dr. Wibley? Aye. Mr. Alexander? Aye. R2? An ordinance finding a public necessity for the acquisition of a permanent utility easement over a portion of the property located at 3339 Clark Circle, authorizing the city manager to enter into an agreement to purchase the utility easement, accepting the deed of easement from Deborah C. Pierce on behalf of the city, and authorizing the expenditure of the sum of up to $10,000 from funds heretofore appropriated for acquisition of this easement and for all related transactional costs. Dispense with the charter requirement for reading the ordinance and adopt. Ms. Graves? Aye. Ms. Johnson? Aye. Ms. McClellan? Aye. Mr. Riddick? Aye. Mr. Smeagle? Aye. Mr. Thomas? Aye. Dr. Wibley? Aye. Mr. Alexander? Aye. R3? An ordinance authorizing the reduction by $15,000 of the purchase price of the property known as the Valentine School to alleviate the cost of rehabilitation incurred by the developer. Dispense with the charter requirement for reading the ordinance and adopt. Ms. Graves? Um, this $15,000, uh, what extra costs? Mr. 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 Mayor, um, uh, from the time that uh, the developer was selected and the contract was negotiated was literally over a year. There was a hole in the roof. Uh, the developer couldn't get in to fix it. That, that hole got worse and worse, and okay. frankly, he, he's going to incur at least $15,000 worth okay, of extra yeah. expense. Okay, very good. Aye. Thank you. Ms. Johnson? Aye. Ms. McClellan? Aye. Mr. Riddick? Aye. Mr. Smeagle? Aye. Mr. Thomas? Aye. Dr. Wibley? Aye. Mr. Alexander? Aye. R4? A resolution approving the renewal and revision of the Norfolk Community Services Board's performance contract with the Commonwealth for fiscal year 2018. Adopt the resolution, Ms. Graves? Aye. Ms. Johnson? Aye. Ms. McClellan? Aye. Mr. Riddick? Aye. Mr. Smeagle? Aye. Mr. Thomas? Aye. Dr. Wibley? Aye. Mr. Alexander? Aye. It's all ahead, Mr. President. All right. So Mr. we're Mayor. moving to our, our new business. The, the first person that I'll call to speak is Audrey Webb. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Welcome. Um, Audrey Webb. I live at 4115 Holly Avenue in Norfolk, Virginia, and I chair the Norfolk Environmental Commission. And we do have members here today, if they would like to stand up and be counted. There we go. Nice representation. Uh, everybody has one of these folders, and the top item is a letter to you all. And what we're... Um, we're presenting this to you this evening because in our advisory capacity, uh, we would like you to consider this letter as it regards offshore drilling and seismic testing. And I will read the letter to you. Dear Mayor Alexander, members of the City Council, the potential for seismic testing and drilling for oil and gas off the coast of Virginia is moving forward quickly. Like many other cities on the Atlantic coast, Norfolk has the opportunity to make a statement regarding the effect this could have on our community. As a group tasked with advising on environmental issues, the Norfolk Environmental Commission has considered the benefits and risks to the city from seismic testing, exploration, and drilling for oil and gas off the coast of Virginia, and offers the following thoughts for your consideration. We support the diversification of our economy and the creation of new well-paying jobs. However, oil and gas exploration and drilling off of our coast promise to bring very few long-term jobs and will adversely affect the mainstay of our economy, the military. Both the US Navy and NASA have expressed serious concerns regarding the impacts that oil and gas drilling off the coast of Virginia will have on their operations in the same areas. 
The U.S. Navy carries out critical operations and training exercises in the Atlantic Ocean off of our coast. In a report released October 30, 2015 by the Department of Defense, the lease areas off the coast of Virginia were classified in two categories, no oil and gas activity and no permanent oil and gas surface structures. This is a recommendation of the Department of Defense for these areas off of our coast that are critical to their training operations. In addition, oil and gas operations are potentially very risky to our waterways and beaches. The effects of disaster similar to the BP Deepwater Horizon spill in 2010 would be catastrophic for Hampton Roads tourism, commercial fisheries, recreational fishing, and our quality of life as Norfolk residents who enjoy our rivers and beaches. The concern for environmental risks extends beyond a potential disaster to the problems associated with seismic air gun blasting and the day-to-day -day operation of explore, exploration equipment, drilling operations, and transport of gas and oil. Regular smaller spills are a routine part of operations. Seismic air gun blasting is harmful to marine life from zooplankton to migrating whales and dolphin. Oil and gas are toxic to blue crab larvae that are spawned at the mouth of the bay and float miles into the Atlantic before returning to live out their lives in the Chesapeake Bay. Juvenile and larva forms of other fin fish and shellfish are also vulnerable. In addition, oil can directly poison or de debilitate oysters, fish, seabirds, and other wildlife. Lastly, spills are difficult to contain, very expensive to clean up, and have long-term effects on marine ecosystems and coastal communities. Oil reaching land and spill response activities can destroy sensitive areas like wetlands, and wetlands are essential for habitat, water quality, and flood protection. Flood protection, please note that one. <laughs> Uh, the benefits of these areas to the city are even more pronounced as we increasingly are confronted with recurring flooding and sea level rise. We appreciate everything the Mayor and the City Council have done to restore and protect our natural resources and to address the challenges of sea level rise. Your leadership has led to significant improvements in water quality and critical habitats like wetlands being protected. And your leadership on addressing sea level rise and flooding is creating a new, sustainable, and resilient Norfolk. We also appreciate all that you do to maintain a good relationship with the military, especially our partners in the US Navy, who are a major economic driver and stabilizer for our city and region. Thank you for considering our thoughts on this important issue. We urge you to join the other cities along the Atlantic coast and speak out in opposition to seismic testing and offshore drilling. It is not worth the risk to our environment and our economy. Thank you Thank very you, much. Thank you, Ms. Webb, for chairing our Environmental Commission and your team. Thank you for being here. You gonna tell her about the resolution? I will. <laughs> uh, Don Pratt. Good evening. My name is Dawn Pratt. Um, I reside in Virginia Beach, but I was a Norfolk police officer for 18 and a half years and medically retired in May of 13. Um, I was injured while on duty and um, I had no choice but to retire. I have been getting my regular retirement checks steadily um, through direct deposit since I have retired. And in April, or excuse me, March 31 of this year, my check was not direct deposited. Um, the following month, that was a Friday. The following Monday, I started calling the retirement office. Um, got no response. Then I talked to Lauren at the mayor's office, who made a couple phone calls, and finally got somebody to call me back. Since then, um, a week later, or excuse me, no, a few days later, I had a, a check written to me because they said our, the retirement office said that it was because of Sedgwick, who is the insurance carrier, that my check was, was not in. There was a mistake. They had just had a meeting about me and to call back in a couple weeks to see if it was resolved. Um, when I called back a week later, nobody called me back. I called mayor's office again, talked to Lauren. She again made another phone call. 
By this time, I had talked to Ms. Nexon at the city attorney's office. She called me and said that Mr. Grisalfi, who was supposed to get in touch with me from the retirement office, said that she was calling on his behalf and that I had not been paid because I had supposedly been overpaid since I have been retired in the excess of forty to $45,000. Um, and I asked her when this happened, and she said, I'm just advising you that the city has the right to get their money back, and you're being notified now. And I said, well, nobody's called me, nobody's done anything, nothing has changed. I, I don't understand what's going on, and I told her, or she, I asked who I could talk to after that, and she said, Miss Heather Mullen. I said, I cannot talk to Heather Mullen because I have a comp attorney. At that point, uh, Miss Nexon has cut me off and not called me back, not returned my phone calls or anything, saying that I have an attorney handling this, which I do not. I have a workman's comp attorney handling my workman's comp claim. Um, since then, I have talked to finance, I have talked to retirement, I have talked to Mike Goldsmith from the city manager's office, um, who I worked for as a police officer, and he had no, nothing to give me. He said that there's some big mess up with the city, and they don't know whether it's Cedric or if it's the city, but nobody has ever contacted me to this day of why my checks are not arriving or my direct deposit um, in December of 2016 do I need to stop now you can wrap up here. okay in December 2016 I was overpaid tw uh, excuse me I was overpaid it, my direct deposit was put in um, twice in December of 16 and I called the city and it was taken care of it was taken out like I said since nobody has ever contacted me I went to the news last week because nobody will talk to me. Nobody will say, hey, this is what you owe. Hey, this is why you owe it. Hey, this is when it started. This is when we found out. I know I'm not the only one. Supposedly there's five. I've talked to another one that the same thing has happened to. We have no idea what's going on. If, if I owe money, then let's get a payment plan and let's pay it back. I'm not saying that there's not something wrong with my checks. I have no idea. I have paperwork stating this is what you are paid every month as a retiree. That's what I'm getting paid. When, if I had ever gotten anything else, I made a phone call to retirement. I talked to Miss Cheryl, uh, excuse me, Miss Potter Griggs, multiple times. She knows me by face. She's not there anymore. Yeah. So let me um, let me just say that um, if you have an attorney, it will prevent um, the city attorney and, and the city manager from speaking directly with you and, and, and helping you in a payment plan. But if you do not have an attorney, I've already directed uh, Mr. Goldsmith to work out a, a payment plan. And so if, uh, to, so that if uh, the monies that you were overpaid can be paid back. And so if you don't have an attorney, I think- uh, I, don't have, I don't have an okay. attorney. I have well, a workman's comp attorney is what I have. But why does it take me coming here to get an answer. Why couldn't somebody there talk to me? Why couldn't somebody there talk to me or retirement that said they were going to call me and give me, you know, well, updates? Well, Mr. Mr. Uh, Pishko and Mr. Uh, Chief Goldsmith, they're willing to talk to you and work out your payment plan. Okay? Thank you. Thank you for coming. Mr. Mayor. Yes. If we Ms. have Grace. other people like that, she said there were other people. If we have other people like yes, that, we need to make are. sure that people know what's going on with their money. I mean, we can't just not pay people and expect them to be okay so with Ms. that. Grace, I think this case is a little different from okay. the previous cases that we dealt with uh, early in the year. The but I was, still, going... I was still getting a check every every month or a direct deposit every month, and it stopped yes, without any cause, any nothing, no letter. I talked to somebody the other day for two and a half hours. He was notified two weeks ago, and he's been trying to get answers since April I first. think we just need well, to make sure people are notified. Ms. Pratt, we're, we're willing to work out a payment plan. You. you will uh, hear from uh, our, uh, our attorney and, and Mr. Goldsmith and structure that payment plan. Can you tell me when? Um, you'll see Mr. Goldsmith at the back of the chamber tonight. Okay, thank, thank you. you. All right, thank you. Um, we have several uh, citizens and uh, concerned citizens here representing Booker T. Washington High School, Bruce uh, Smith is here. He uh, called me a, a few weeks ago and we sat down and and we talked about uh, Booker T, and he asked me some pointed questions. And I wanted just to uh, state 
for the record, what I shared with Mr. Smith, and I'll call him and about seven other uh, persons. Um, so um, concerning the maintenance of Booker T. Washington High School, uh, all operating funds except construction, technology, and infrastructure funds are sent directly uh, to Norfolk Public Schools in a lump sum. And those funds are controlled and allocated by Norfolk Public Schools. Um, the CIP funds for maintenance are controlled and allocated by Norfolk Public Schools. In fact, all of the school buildings are maintained by Norfolk Public Schools. If you look at Booker T. Washington in particular, uh, all parking lot repairs, lights, and litter pickup, and school signs are maintained by Norfolk Public Schools. Um, if you look at the fencing on Princess Anne or Virginia Beach Boulevard, those fence, uh, fences are maintained by Norfolk Public Schools. Um, the lump sum that we appropriated in our ordinance, uh, 46853, uh, totals $124,589,000. That's $600 million more than what was allocated in FY17. In fact, this council lobbied the General Assembly uh, in, in House Bill 1500, Chapter 836 of Acts of the Assembly, we were able to uh, get an additional $6 million in state funding for Norfolk Public Schools, bringing the state total to over $197,800,000. Um, having said that, uh, I shared with uh, Mr. Smith, I welcome him and Mr. Brothers, I see Mr. Whitaker and others are here to come to address the council, but I do want to uh, state again that all operating funds except construction, technology, and infrastructure funds are sent directly to Norfolk Public Schools in a lump sum, and those funds are controlled, and those funds are allocated by Norfolk Public Schools. And number two, all school buildings are maintained by Norfolk Public Schools. Okay, Mr. Smith, welcome. Mayor Alexander, <clears throat> members of the City Council, uh, thank you for allowing me a few minutes to speak with you about a dire problem that is taking place at Booker T. Washington High School. Uh, we, the citizens and, and alumni of, of Booker T. Washington High School, and, and first, uh, I think everyone knows me, but uh, I'm a native of Norfolk, a graduate of Booker T. Washington High School in 1981, and I am a taxpayer in Norfolk as well. Which brings me to, uh, to stand up for those that don't have a voice those that voices have not been heard, uh, to speak out uh, for the community that is underserved, uh, and to look at the neglect that has been taking place for years and years and years at Booker T. Washington High School is unacceptable. We have two issues here. The average lifespan of a school is roughly 50 years. Having said that, Booker T. Washington High School is approaching or roughly around 42 years old. So we have two problems, and I'll address a, a few of those issues uh, in, in the next minute. Um, one is there needs to be appropriation of funds that will start being allocated for a new building of Booker T. Washington High School, a new construction of Booker T. Washington High School. But currently, as it stands right now, there is a health issue. There is a safety issue that is taking place at Booker T. Washington High School because of the egregious neglect that has taken place. Now, when we point these facts out, we don't want the fingers to be pointed in different direction at other bodies that run the city. We want results. We are not giving these kids a fair opportunity to succeed in life. And that is a problem. This is a historical high school with rich history. And we're allowing this uh, uh, to be uh, 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 a situation that 
that these kids are living in despair when they go to this particular school, their educational experience. And that's not right. It's not fair. So we have to speak out and we have to do something about this. I had an opportunity to visit Booker T. Watson High School uh, uh, a few months ago. And what I saw was very <coughs> disturbing. And it's because of years of neglect. So, so what about codes when we start talking about buildings that we saw before uh, in this store, Ghent? What about the code of this high school and the kids that, were, that are being left behind? Where is the investment in them? There's mold growing in the school. The roof leaks. It's the same basketball, hardwood basketball floor that I played on when I was in high school. These are the same bleachers that a lady fell through uh, a few months ago. The same bleachers when I was in high school. This is utter neglect. Now, I'm not pointing the finger at, at city council. I'm not necessarily pointing the finger at school board, but something has to be done. Someone has to be held accountable. The, the city council appropriates these funds to Norfolk Public Schools, and they allocate these funds to be spent. They have to be held accountable. We have to be, there has to be a higher standard set for these, these funds to go where they're supposed to go because years and years of neglect have sent these funds to other schools and have neglected Booker T. Washington High School. And if that is acceptable, there's something wrong because again, we are not investing in the most valuable asset that we have in our community, which are our kids. We're not giving them a fair opportunity to, to succeed. I want to thank you for the opportunity to speak with you. Um, it, it's I love Norfolk. This is the place where I, I, I made a name for myself. And I hope, hope that I represented Norfolk uh, uh, in, a, a, in, a, in, a, in a great manner. But how many souls and kids are we losing by not providing them with an opportunity to do some of the same things like Tony Brothers doing right now, or Pernell Whitaker, a Hall of Fame boxer, and pound for pound, uh, the greatest that's ever fought? How many students and kids are we losing by not providing them with an opportunity? Thank you for your time, and I, I hope we can address these issues immediately thank, thank you. you mr smith and you've made us very proud thank you very much tony brothers good evening good evening uh bruce really um touched on most of the things and uh, first of all i'd like to thank you all for your service i didn't realize how difficult this job was that's not part of my three minutes how difficult <laughs> this job this job was until i sat here and watched all the things you have to deal with um i will say this that Mr. Thomas made a great point about the buildings and the codes. And, you know, it seems like the city bullies the citizens. So where does the school board really fit into there? So like if, if the city appropriates money to the school board and there is no checks and balances on where it's going, that's a problem. So for me, with the help of the city, thank you, Doug, um, my nonprofit was able to buy uniforms for the baseball team, get bets for the school, get balls for the school, and do everything that we possibly could to help. We want to help. But here's the thing. I'm riding by going to the barbershop, and I notice that someone is cutting the grass at the school. They have their own truck out there. And so I go to the barbershop. I come back. They're still out there. Truck, weedy, to everything. It's the chairman of the school board. He's cutting the grass. So I'm saying, why does he have to cut the grass? It's right after we've gone to the school board and complained. He says, this is the first time I've been there, been here to do this. So I first was just going to take a picture of him and post it on Facebook or whatever and say, look at this guy. He's really jumped in and do that. But I said, I'm not helping. So I grabbed the lawnmower and I started cutting the grass with him. Mm -hmm. And then I thought about it and I said, we live in a city where on 4th of July we have fireworks. We have Harbor Fest. We have all of these things. Downtown's booming. I live in the heart of downtown. I love Norfolk, anybody that knows. But when I go out and I go around, I brag about Old Dominion, and everyone talks about how it's grown. And look at it now. Look at it now. 
No one says that about Booker T. No one. And I just think somewhere between the appropriation of the money and how the money is spent, I think there has to be somewhere or something in there in between to check to make sure that a school that is now down to an enrollment of 700 that someone is looking at that. And lastly, today I met with Hugh Copeland because we were told by the superintendent that Booker T is the School of the Arts. And I said, what does that mean? School, what does it mean? What arts are there? That, that question couldn't be answered. But Lake Taylor is a technology school. So I said, my son's a graphics design kid. That falls under arts at VCU, the number one art school in the country. It falls under arts. So why don't we have that there when it's earmarked to go to Lake Taylor under technology? You all understand, I think, what I'm saying. I'm saying that the kids over there, Tony Brothers is one of the top 12 in the world at what he does because he went to Booker T. No other reason. Norfolk Public Schools. My three minutes is up. Thank you. Tony, we're very proud of you as well. Pernell Sweet Pea Whitaker. Pound for pound. Welcome. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, uh, City Council. I love this city. I love it. I love North. I was born and raised here. And I love what the city of Norfolk has done for Pernell Whitaker in his career. I still today consider Norfolk Scope my house. <laughs> you know, uh, we've had some great times. Uh, I've, I've watched this city grow, and I've seen the fantastic things that have been done to the city of Norfolk. I appreciate you guys naming a street after me, the street of which I grew up on, 831 Cumberland Street naming it uh, Whitaker's Lane. And I'm an alumni of Booker T. Washington High School. I love Booker T. I'm a Booker. So uh, the I. year of 82, you know, my graduated in 1982. I love Booker T. Washington. We had a great facility, a great faculty, great students. But today, <laughs> you know, it is, it's a problem for me all. I don't really have a big problem with what's going on outside with cutting the grass and all. My, my main concern is the mold. The mold and the, the air condition running in and out for weeks. You know, there's a whole lot of Bruce Smiths, there's a whole lot of Tony Brothers, and there's a whole lot of Sweet Pea Whitaker in that school. And we have to give them the opportunity to pursue their dreams and admirations. And in order for them to do that, they have to be in a great environment. Or, or people are going to start getting sick, and it's going to fall down to the city. It's going to fall on you guys, and, and I wouldn't, wouldn't want to see that happen to anyone. I wouldn't want to see anyone kid have to get ill over a, a building full of mold. I just heard a, a voice of a kid coming from the council, the bench coming from the bench over there, and I was thinking that's that's a, that's a kid, that's a kid, that's a kid that we have to look out for, and we have to look out for these kids also that go to, to book where, wherever all the schools. We have to look out for. We have to make sure they're in a safe, a good and safe environment, so that they can uh, pursue their dreams and admirations. You know. Like I said, there's a lot of Bruce, a lot of Tony Brothers, and a lot of Pernell Whitakers over in Booker T. Washington. And I really want to see these kids go. And I don't want to see them showing up on TV in the hospitals. Or I don't want to see a, you guys getting, I don't want to see lawsuits all over you guys every week. So um, if there is someone that we know that you guys, that this council know, that can take a good look at this. You know, I think it'll be in the best interest of all of us. And I like that sound. I thought that was my people, but I... <laughs> <laughs> it's time to get back in the ring, man. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I thought it sounded like I'm coming from the ring. I want this fight to end. I want this fight to get be over with and take care of the kids and all, uh, so that everybody can be happy. I love Norfolk, Virginia. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for what you do. Thank you very much. Uh, Lula Sears Rogers. <coughs> Good evening, everyone. Good evening. To Mr. Mayor and members of the City Council. 
I am a 1959 graduate of the historic Booker T. Washington High School, the only Norfolk High School to hold graduation in 1959, the only school to hold graduation in 1959 due to the closing of the secondary schools of the city of Norfolk to comply with the laws of massive resistance. Some of you remember that Mayor Frame had a big uh, we had a big ceremony for the 50th year. We're getting ready to come to the 60th year in uh, February the 2nd. That's when the schools opened, February the 2nd, 2019. 13 of my 15 siblings are graduates of this school, making it a total of, in my extended family, 51 persons in my family have graduated from Booker T. Washington High School. Booker T. Washington joins the I.C. Norcom High School in being the last of the remaining historical high schools in the state of Virginia. We need your help. This school needs to either be repaired, refurbished, rebuilt, one or the other. We can do this, and we need your help. The school is 43 years old and the building needs to be brought back to mint condition to make it attractive to the students of Norfolk, as are the other high schools in Norfolk. Mm -hmm. What can we do to stop the students from walking past this historic school to attend other high schools that are more inviting, Maury, Norview, Granby, Lake Taylor, thus keeping the enrollment at this all-time continuous low as he said, of 700. The mold, the lighting, the roof, the slats falling from the water, uh, air conditioned system in the back of the school, the heating, the softball, the baseball, the tennis courts are all in poor condition. And please let me remind you that my daughter is a teacher at this school and I'm concerned about her health. What can the tens of thousands of alumni do? Yes, there was a rumor around saying they were going to tear Booker T down, so we jumped on this thing. So now we want to know, when will someone begin work there? When will somebody help us bring this school up to date, which should include technology and other resources? Alumni from not just Norfolk, but all over the world, are waiting a reply as to what's going to happen to the historic Booker T. Washington High School. I thank you so very much for your time. Thank you. Glennis Mason. My name is Glennis Mason. Um, my address, 3736 Wedgefield Avenue, Norfolk, Virginia. Good evening, Mayor Alexander and esteemed members of the City Council. As a member of the Concerned Citizens of Booker T. Washington High School, we ask that the City Council review the school division's goals and objectives as posted on the NPS website. In part, it states, the school environment should be responsive and conducive to learning. Include dedicated teachers using a variety of techniques, a classroom atmosphere for students, to function and develop according to their abilities, and safety, physical comfort, and appearance, which are vital environmental components. We address the school board, and now we are bringing our concerns to the city council. Because the school board has continuously failed to adhere to their very own goals and objectives, it appears that our beloved school is on its way to becoming non-existent based on a lack of attention to the problems reported and those that you've heard. No high school in the city of Norfolk has undergone the level of neglect that Booker T has incurred. There is clearly a lack of concern, resources, and unequal attention to Booker T. Our concerns include, but are not limited, limited to, the presence of mold continues to be a problem. Booker T does not have any spring sports or home games because, because of demolished tennis courts, poor lighting, inoperable bleachers, in the gym that lack guardrails for safety precautions, an outdated track, no dugout for softball games, and the athletic department must utilize their funds to transport students to other schools to practice, therefore reducing funds available for the students' athletic activities. Equipment required to 
to make Booker T a school of the arts is obsolete. The school has what appears to be CRT monitors available for classroom use, which contain lead, and the only flat screen TV is in the teacher's lounge. The multimedia class needs to be updated with soundproof walls. Carpets need to be replaced. Tripods are needed for studio cameras. Updated software and computers are necessary for both the lab and the photography class. A light board that works is required, and the addition of a recording studio is needed as an added means to recruit students and to enha enhance the specialty program. Some improvements have been made in the auditorium. However, the, the new chairs are not num numbered, causing seating confusions at events. Lighting was replaced with substandard 28 wattage instead of the original 90 watts. Other lights were replaced with 200 watt household bulbs. Can I continue? Several requests were made to retrieve the state-of-the-art bulbs, but the requests were never answered. The school needs to be power washed or painted. At the City Council on June 21st, Mr. Rodney Jordan, school board chair, confirmed that rumors that we've heard of the school being closed was false and that no plans to close or reloc relocate the school were being considered by the board. However, a 15 or even a 20 year plan was not divulged. In closing, we the community, alumni, and concerned citizens will continue to address these problems until they are fully resolved, contacting other agencies if necessary to ensure our students' safety. Because we know our students deserve to learn in an environment that provides support for their educational needs, because that we know that. This can be achieved at Booker T. Washington High School. If the school system, what seems to be the impression, ceases its constructive efforts to close this school by withholding resources that will make the school successful. With your assistance and making sure that the school board distributes <coughs> funds appropriately and fairly, the pride that derived from the rich history and legacy of Booger T. Washington High School in Norfolk, Virginia can continue. Thank you. Thank you. Charles Gore. Start my three minutes yet. <laughs> Good evening. My name is Charles Gore. I reside at thirty eight forty Eastern Avenue in the city of Norfolk, Virginia. That's in the Ingleside section of Norfolk. The Civic League of Ingleside adopted the motto, keep the pride in Ingleside. That's why I'm here to talk to you a little bit about with the limited amount of time I've got. Pride, a tradition at Booker T. Washington High School we're a family that are steeped in pride. That's in our history. I'd like the family to stand up and let the people see you, if you would. Thank you so much. We're here to ask you to help us <clears throat> Keep the pride in the process so that we can keep the pride in the product. I'm going to use the word blessing because I am blessed to have been able to see Booker T then and see Booker T now. I graduated in 1962. This year we will celebrate the 55th anniversary of our graduation. I can see Booker T then, 
and I see Booker T now. In 1962, the student enrollment at Booker T was 2,640. The teachers and support group numbered 99. There was a marching band of 120 students. We had a band director, Mr. James Moore Clark. We had a choir director, Mr. I. Sherman Green. Mm. They're legends. I went to that building they call the factory. But the tradition remained and was transferred from the factory to the new school. And the thing about the factory was we produced world-class scholars and athletes. We've always had a tradition that we take pride in the process so we can have pride in the product. Singers, band leaders, music directors, musicians, I can't number them all that we enjoy today because of the process that's a tradition at Booker T. Washington High School. We have pride in the process so that we can have pride in the product. Finally, I'd just like to say this. If I had stood here in 1962, I would have not been able to see the diversity that I look at tonight. Because we had an opportunity to take pride in a process, we can take pride today in the product that sits before me. Ladies and gentlemen, pride is contagious. We can all catch it again. Thank you. Cecilia Merrick. Uh, good, evening. good evening. Mayor Alexander, <coughs> members of the City Council, Ms. Johnson, and ladies and gentlemen, I am a 1961 graduate of Booker T. Washington High School. I am a resident, again, in Norfolk, Virginia, and I'm here to let you know that we are not your adversaries. We just want to help. But in order for us to help, we need answers to questions. I won't go on I don't know about the mold situation, but what I will say is to the average person, it looks to me that you, the city of Norfolk, setting Booker T up to fail. I said this because you have three projects slated for demolition, and I understand Tidewater Park is already beginning to empty out. Those students from Tidewater Park, Young's Terrace, uh, Calvert Park, are the students that flow mostly into Booger T. If you close the elementary schools in those projects by getting rid of the projects, that means Ruffner goes. If Ruffner goes, then who are the students that will be coming into Booger T in the future? And something else that's going on. We, I think we had five black principals being set free this year, relieved of their duties as principals. I'm not blaming you, but you are the head of the city. You're the commander in chief here in Norfolk. Those people go to school for years and years and years to become doctorates. They're not stupid people. Your Norfolk public school system know of the troubled schools. And they are wise enough to know also that a troubled school won't be turned around in one, 
two years, not even maybe three. But when people are showing progress, you don't reward progress with disciplining them and kicking them out, kicking them to the curb, if they were never there and served a purpose. I said in that public school meeting also last month, those kids from Ruffner came in crying, begging, if not the public school system, to not let that principal go. She was teaching those kids to have faith in themselves. She deals with a homeless group of kids that don't know what they're going to eat after they leave school that day, where they're going to sleep that night. She takes their clothes home and laundry them, wash and iron them and bring them back so that they can be clean and won't be ostracized by their peers. This is not a bad principal. She's a principal with heart and soul. And I don't know that much about the other principals, but I'm familiar with the, some of the kids from the STEM Academy because we come in contact with them on a pretty regular basis when we hold meetings at the Campus Civil Resource Center. Those kids are not helpless. They are not useless. They just need a chance. And if you're going to be destabilizing what normalcy they've come to know over a one or two year period, how are they to grow? May I continue? How are they to grow and succeed and make it to Booker T if you're going to chop them down before they get a chance to start? And I have three other things I'd like to just state before you. We had gotten permission to get a bus that was authorized by the Norfolk Public School, and it was cut down and shot down before it even came to fruition. You own the streets in Norfolk. The kids don't. They have to walk through what is a well-documented and known as a flood zone area. Who wants to come to school? The attendance drops. Who wants to be wet sitting in the classroom all day wet? dredging their way through tons of water trying to get to education. That problem is yours, not theirs. And I wish you would take it off the backs of the kids at Booker T and ask your school board to please reinstate that bus. The kids need it. And my last things I want to say is, we have a problem with youth incarceration everywhere. And I would just like to ask the city council here tonight what is your five-year, 10-year, 15, 20, 25-year plan for that area which Booger T sits? With the demolition of those projects, has to be something else on the drawing board to be put there in the future. And that will affect the students who are enrolled or will be enrolled in Booger T. The other problem that we have is incarceration, youth incarceration in the city of Norfolk, just like all over the city all over the country, really. There's nothing, do you have anything in plan to help these young people to stop that revolving door syndrome? It makes me sick. The fact that they go in there, they sit, they watch TV, they play basketball. Most of them don't even have a high school diploma. When you are incarcerated, I understand you lose your freedom. So why do you have the freedom to sit around and do nothing all day? That's because nobody cares. If they were mandatory that they have to have a GED if you didn't come in here with one, then that's going to extend your time for being incarcerated because we have to do something to help those kids to keep returning. I ask you again, do you have anything, I know you can't discuss it tonight, on the agenda to discuss this problem. I thank you for your time. Thank you. James Charman. Good afternoon, Council. Good afternoon. Uh, I'm James Jarman, Jr. I reside at 5503 Barn Hollow in the Poplar Hall section of Norfolk. Uh, I came to readdress the same issues. I would be remiss if I did not mention uh, my Booger T, Booger T family. I'm also alumni from Booger T. I graduated from uh, the one that's there now. Uh, in an interview with the TV station, I simply asked them to let's work together and everybody put some skin in the game and try to keep history from repeating itself. Uh, the original Booger T 
stood uh, roughly adjacent to where the uh, present Booger T is. It was sometimes affectionately called a factory and sometimes not so affectionately or uh, in a derogatory manner. Either way, the thing about a factory is it produces. Factories can produce athletes. They can produce outstanding citizens as yourself. Uh, they produce painters. They produce landscapers and the lot. I note in my coming back and forth to council meetings, most people ask <laughs> council, can I have a cookie out of that jar, so to speak? What I asked that Booker T is that some of the fruit, myself and others, come to council and ask council, we'll do A, can you help us with B? We'll do C, can you help us with D? So everybody has some skin in the game. I think that we have five principles that were dismissed from schools. Booger T is part of the problem. I would hate to see history repeat itself. The original Booger T was left to stand and fall in such a state of disrepair that it became economically infeasible to repair it. The original Booger T was the equivalent of I.C. Norcom in Portsmouth. And I heard counsel and the other goings on in here tonight. Uh, we talking about historic uh, buildings and saving them at any cost. Booger T was not afforded that opportunity, the original one. And I would beseech you to not let the same fate fall, uh, the existing one now. Uh, in short, we have children and our seeds into the future, as I have spoken to you before. At the Southside STEM Academy, Booger T, Ruffner, and a lot of the affected schools. I realized the schools and the situations did not get that way overnight. And they not going to be cleared up by the stroke of a pen or dumping money on them and be cleaned up overnight. But I think we can work together as a community and as a governing body, and we can make some progress in toward the, the, the right direction. Very few people I notice come to council and compliment them on anything. You get a lot of complaints. So I will say this to you. I'm always pleased to see a governing body start out their meetings acknowledging our Lord and Savior. I'm also pleased to see a governing body pledge allegiance to the flag. I want you to remember the students at Southside STEM Academy, Booger T, Ruffner, and the other four schools don't have that option. So I think it's time to stand up and be counted as men and do what we can. If you do the best you can and give your all, you gave it. Nobody can complain. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Mr. Riddick, you have some comments you would like to make. Mr. Yeah. Riddick. Yeah, first I'd like to thank, uh, thank all of you who have come down with the passion that you've expressed about Booker T. Washington. Uh, I finished Booker T. 50, I don't know, 50. Careful. Some years 51. ago, 51 years ago, <laughs> May Alexander's, May Alexander's mother and I finished the same year. And believe it or not, at our class, we had 647 <coughs> graduates. And now you only have 700 students there. Um, as, as, as May Alexander mentioned earlier uh, in his comments, the school board has its own autonomy. And once we give them the funds to uh, operate the school district, you know, it's up to them uh, to allocate them. But it's unfortunate that 
uh, in this particular instance, uh, I'm going to ask this council to have a discussion on the possibility, and it would take the majority of this council to uh, to have a discussion, and we probably won't have to won't be able to do it until our retreat because we're getting ready to go on vacation. And uh, but I think we need. Uh, to evaluate the school, the first thing we need to do is eradicate the mold, anything that's going to make these youngsters, you know, ill uh, in the uh, upcoming school year, and anything that's going to uh, make the uh, school safer, we need to do that. When we built the field houses and the athletic fields at Booker T, uh, we had to do it with the city council's money because the school board decided that if we gave them the money, they were not going to put it in the field houses. They were not going to put it in after the fields at Booker T, Lake Taylor, and over at uh, um, where uh, ODU is, uh, where Grand Bay and Maury play, Powhatan Field. Field. So uh, my suggestion would be if the council would consider it, because, I mean, every, every uh, we talk about this school, all the, a lot of our schools have needs, but this particular school is a very crucial need uh, because it does have health and safety involved. But I'd like to have this council to have a discussion about evaluating what's wrong with BTW, the possibility of advancing them, the cost of repairs, and then deduct it from future budgets. If it's if it's if it's somehow we could you know find the money to to repair it, and then in the next and if it's maybe two or three million dollars, then in the next you know six or seven budgets we debit that you know for. Three hundred thousand dollars, but it's going to take a discussion uh, on a part of this entire council because all of us represent schools in our uh, districts that need repair, and so I just hope <clears throat> that we can have a honest discussion about Booker T. Washington, realizing the historical uh, aspects of it, and 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 do what's necessary to make it a viable entity. Uh, None of the Booker T. or Ruffner, nor Ruffner, would be uh, affected by the uh, St. Paul Boulevard Quadrant. Those schools would be there, and so uh, it's important that we recognize the impact that they're going to experience, and do what we can do to, you know, get ready for it. Mr. Mayor. Yeah. Yes, Ms. Johnson. If I may. Yes, please. Um, I want to say thank you for coming out this this evening and expressing your your concerns. Um, some months ago, I requested of uh, the city to do an inspection of Booger T. Washington High School, um, both inside and outside of the schools. This evening, you were provided this map, which indicates the um, outside of Booger T. Washington High School. Um, we're not pointing fingers, but I just wanted to give you some insight on the responsibility of the city as well as Booger T. Washington High School. As far as the request for an inspection for the inside of Booger T. Washington um, High School, a request was sent over to uh, Norfolk Public Schools because we had to make a request in order to be able to go in to do the inspection. We did get a reply back. Uh, the reply uh, back stated that Norfolk Public Schools was in the process of doing an inspection of Booker T. Washington High School and several other schools and that they would provide a detailed report to the citizens sometime during the fall. So I wanted to make sure that you were aware of what I had requested, what has been done up to that point, and that we have to uh, request to go inside of Booger T. Washington um, High School to do an inspection. And we did get a response back to Norfolk Public Schools that they would be doing the inspection and data would be provided to the public sometime in the fall. Um, and I can only say, Ms. Hester and the Concerned Citizens Group, um, I have been over to Booger T. Washington. We've been in the atrium 
Um, we did massive work. The signs at Booker T. Washington, taking all of the signs off, um, having them redone, painting the entranceway to Booker T. Washington that says Booker T. Washington High School, and also partnering with Botanical Gardens to have landscaping done where it says Booker T. Washington um, High School with the understanding that it would be maintained once the work from the community and all of us was done um, at that point. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mr. Mayor, yes, I, I did request yes, to Ms. speak. Yes, Ms. Hester, please come. You yes. Are, Mr. Riddick had just requested to speak, so I just. Oh, I'm you, sorry. You, you okay. finished, Mr. Riddick? Well, yes. I, I yes. did yes. want you to. You were next on the list, Ms. Hester. Thank you. I just wanted you to know that you're not alone. The concerned citizens of Booker T. Washington High School are here to help. And this is why we're here. We're not here as a critical piece, but we are here as concerned about our children and where Booker T. Washington is going. And so we want you to know that we are here to help you. We are in that building every, every month. We are providing for the students. We provide for the staff. We are a support, and our mission is to be that support for the school. And so please, if you need us, we are there. We will not go away. We are not going to allow our historically black high school in Norfolk, in this wonderful city, to go without a fight. We are not going to allow our children to spend days sitting in uh, mold and, and dampness and uh, an environment that is not conducive to education. And I do want to thank you for allowing us to be here because we will come back. We're not, we're not done until it's done. So if you have ideas or if you would like for us to serve on uh, commissions or, or committees, we're available. We are dedicated to Booker T. Washington High School. Thank you very much for your energy and your uh, you're just listening to our story because it is a wonderful story because we have presented to you our passion and our passion is to maintain our school. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you, Ms. Hester. Ma'am? Yes, Ms. Graves. Um, I too want to take the opportunity to thank everybody for coming out. Um, I am also a graduate of Booker T. Washington High School, class of 90, 1990. Um, Booker T. graduate is still a Booker T. graduate. <laughs> um, and, and I remember um, when I went to Booker T., everybody said I went to the new school. And it didn't quite seem to me like it was new, but I guess it was compared to the old Booker T. Um, I find the conditions of Booker T to be um, quite horrific, and especially given the, the population of students that we serve who may not come from the greatest home environments, and we send them to school expecting them to do well, and they may have, quite honestly, crappy home lives, and then we send them to um, a crappy school. And so um, I think that what we can do with all of the, the classes um, that are involved and all of the individuals that are involved, all of the um, celebrity status that we have that came from Booker T, all of the local interest that we have that has come from Booker T, is possibly formulate a public-private partnership for the um, funding of some of these repairs that need to be made to Booker T. Washington High School. Um, it, 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 we, we can't make more widgets. We can't raise taxes. That's just, not, I mean, that's just not something that we can do. But what we can do is, um, you know, everyday ordinary citizens, um, pledging funds um, to help to raise the money, um, using some of the celebrity status that we have from Booker T, not just the ones that are here, but reaching out to the ones that are in, in other localities that have moved out of the area that are concerned about Booker T and that would be willing to lend their name, their talent. Um, we also have individuals who are um, in the building fields who might be willing to lend themselves, their crews, their 
whoever to help make these things happen. And so I think if we put our heads together, um, we can solve this problem. It's unfortunate that the neglect of the school has gone on far, far beyond um, what it should have. Um, but I think that we have an opportunity to put our heads together and do something great for, um, as one of the speakers put it, this historically black high school in the city of Norfolk. Okay, thank you, Ms. Graves. All right, uh, Danny Lee Ginn. My name is Danny Lee Ginn. I reside at 3844 Dare Circle. Uh, I was here last week and was delighted uh, that you had nominated Mr. Smith as a city council, as I had congratulated you all. Uh, but uh, to continue from that, I had picked up uh, the newspaper uh, on June the 27th, and I began to re read it. Uh, uh, and I'm going to review just a few paragraphs because I think it hits the nail on the head uh, as to frustration of many of the citizens. Uh, it says, never mind that the people selected would be better served by emerging from a transparent process, one that encourages interaction with members of the community. And never mind that Norfolk City Council has suffered for years from a lack of openness and that closed doors allow corruption to go unchecked. Hiring a city manager is the most important job the city council will do. It's among the most consequential decisions that Norfolk will make. It's a choice that speaks volume about the city and what it aspires to be. And today's message from the city hall is loud and clear. That message is, citizens keep out. And that is what you are sending to the rest of the city. So when I talk to some of you and you say, Danny, you're just a lone old man who comes up here week after week and nobody comes behind you. That's because the citizens have heard you loud and clear. We have heard you, keep out. We don't wanna hear what you have to say. You've sent the message as I, you know, sadly uh, have to conclude when I taught history, um, uh, some 50 years ago, we impound our children with uh, the government is ruled by the people and for the people. But at this point in time, the message is going out loud and clear in Norfolk. The city of Norfolk is ruled by the council and for the council because I come back here every week asking the same questions and I don't get an answer. And that's what other, that's why I come back because other people say, Danny, Keep going. Council's adjourned.